Thanks, Barry, John. Yeah, thank you for for uh, the opportunity. I'm, I've been looking forward to this as well, is um, because it's easy to call upon people who have uh, impressive resumes. It's different calling on people who have significant resumes and are prepared to speak truth to power and also just sort of uh, disrupt our minds. Uh, ref kind of, I, I refer to it as a think shift. So Mzama Masito is, is, is one of these people and that's why it, it's really, um, you know, the next 50 minutes or so, I, I think are gonna be uh, significant for all of us. Um, so Mzamo, I mean, I would encourage you to, to, to check him out online. He's held um, executive marketing positions in Nike, Unilever, Vodafone, both in Africa and, and abroad. And in addition to you know, his, his own scholarship and his own professional track, um, you know, one of the things that particularly attracted me about uh, Mzamo's uh, work is uh, that his NGO called African Men Care, and it funds underprivileged children to further their studies. And it's born out of uh, Mzamo's uh, sort of true north that uh, to be young, gifted, free without opportunity is a devil's gift, and to deny that opportunity is immoral and criminal. And uh, so he is rallying his, uh, his ethos and his network um, and uh, so on for the opportunity. So Mzamo, you know, to be appointed the chief marketing officer of one of the most significant companies of the last two decades um, for the second largest continent on the planet is, is uh, you don't achieve that through busking. So can you get, give us, tell us your story? How, you know, how, how, did, how did you manifest that? Oh, that's, hi everyone. Um, I would say that my career started at the University of Cape Town. I was a lecturer there. I thought I was gonna be a teacher for life because that's all I really wanted to do is teach. And then I wanted to buy my mom a house. And the truth be told, teaching doesn't pay. It's really a great job. It's a calling, but it didn't have shitloads of money. So I thought, let me go look for a job that pays more than teaching so that I can buy my mother a house. I grew up in the shanty towns of Cape Town. I grew up mostly Cape Flats, drug dealers and gangsters and informal settlements of Cape Town. So I then decided that I want to take my mom out of the space so that I can buy a house. So that's how I started. Really. I got a job at Unilever. I worked at Unilever for 11 years until I became vice president, sit in the board of Unilever. And then I decided to leave Unilever and go and work um, for Nike. So I worked for Nike and I was the chief brand officer for Nike looking after World Cup. I really joined Nike for World Cup. Selfishly, actually, I just wanted to do World Cup. And I love sport. I'm a runner. I do ultra marathons, trail, you name it. Like I just run. I mean, the last longest run I did was 300 kilometers. And that is not fun. It's kind of form of, there's something not wrong with me because I don't understand why I'm running 300 kilometers because that's just, I think it's middle class and upper class issues because this just maybe I have too much time on my hands. And so I then decided to leave Nike and then I joined Vodafone because I wanted to understand tech a lot more. So I joined Vodacom, Vodafone. On all of these companies, I've been lucky. With Nike, I was in the US, with Portland, with um, Unilever, I was in the UK and India, working there as well. With um, now, then I thought after leaving Vodafone after six years, I thought, let me join another tech company. But this one was amazingly, um, one of those like where you're doing something good for someone else and then you ended up being paid back in kind. So I was doing a reference for a guy named Anwar Yapi, 
who wanted to join Google. And I was going, giving this reference to the head of EMEA or global recruitment executive search team within Google. And I was giving this reference. And then at the end of that interview, I said to her, hey, you know what? I actually have five things I would like to tell you about Google that I don't like. And then, so she said, what are those things? I told her. And then I thought, oh, cool. I got that out of my chest. It's things I don't like about Google rather than things I like about Google because those are obvious and things that I think one or two that I would like Google to improve or fix about search or YouTube or Geo or any of its products. The following day, she called me and she says, hey, you know what? Actually, we went again to look at our database and actually all that stuff you told us, we like. Would you like to be considered for a job at Google? And then I was like, no, I'm actually not looking for a job. I'm going to exit Vodafone and go back to teaching full time and run my own consultancy and sit in three boards as a non-executive board member and then publish papers. I just want to be a nerdy academic that publishes papers because I feel like there's not a lot of black voices in publishing or academia and literature, particularly journal articles. Our voices are few and all we read about, particularly marketing, will be Kotler or someone in Australia, someone in England. Not that I have anything against them, but I also want diversity of thoughts and voices. So they said, no, why don't you join us? So I went through several interviews, probably over 20 interviews. I declined the offer at first because I genuinely didn't think at that time Google was serious about Africa. And then again, I wrote them a love letter to say that now that you've given me an opportunity to be interviewed by 20 people, I was actually doing market research. I managed to speak to 20 Googlers and I also went to Mountain View in California. I went to the UK. I think I've got an idea now about Google that I didn't have from outside. Here are some seven things that I don't, I've observed and things that I think you need to improve, but I'm not joining you. So I've decided here are my reasons. So I left it at thinking it's done. After two weeks, they came back. They said, well, actually, we're not going to stop because you keep telling us the things that we want to do, but we think now you're the right person to do them because you told us. So why don't you just then please accept our offer and just join? And so after being kind of persuaded after several months, then I joined. So it took a while to join. Actually, it took probably over a year to join because initially I was not convinced. So that's how I got into Google. And also the reason I joined is because when I was in Mountain View in London, I started reading about, because I know what my values are. And I know that my values are freedom, respect, and good. Those are my three guiding North Star values. So every time I look at a company, I try and look at it, its values as well, and then ask other people. And Google only has one value. It's called respect. And it's respect the user, respect the opportunity, and respect each other. So that immediately ticked my box on alignment on values. And then also at Google, when I was there, I had the word for the first time, psychological safety. And they were talking a lot about psychological safety. And they were talking about pro project oxygen, which is what makes effective teams. And one of the key variables on making an effective team and high performing team was psychological safety. I've never heard that before because I've worked in companies where you, people just tell you where to F off and they just use nice language, colorful and, and that's it. And you're never safe or feel safe. And here they are trying so hard to think about how to make a culture safe. And the also other word I had at Google that I didn't hear before was culture ed. So they were not talking about culture fit. They were talking about culture ed. And I was like, oh, that's nice because that means I can be me because they're not asking me to fit. They are looking at what is it that I can add to help Google grow in Africa rather than do I fit? Because I hate when people want me to fit because I'm very rebellious. So I don't do well when I'm being asked to fit. So that's the second thing I had. Then the third one was the purpose. I mean, the mission at Google hasn't changed. It's been the same mission for 23 years, which is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful and helpful. So, I mean, that hasn't changed. And that for me was like, okay, organize the world's information, make it universally accessible, 
make it useful and helpful, I think I can do that, but I just wanna do it for Africa. So as soon as I write the mission, the values, the two keywords, which is psychological safety and culture ed, that kind of for me solidified it. And then I decided that I think I can add something here. And I think they will be able to tolerate or accept my need for agitation or just speaking truth to power, which is kind of thing that I, I'm kind of, I do it and I, not that I intend to, but I just hate, I hate sugar coating and I hate political correctness. That's why I also hate probably cancel culture because I find like everyone is working on eggs and everyone now cannot say what they really think because we all have to really be sensitive, overly sensitive on everything. So for me, I'm just, I prefer straight talk. Just say, that's probably why I like hanging out with African people or Dutch people, because I find them a like, lot more blunt and a lot more straight, German, African, Dutch. They just fit my profile and I get them because they just straight up. And I like that a lot. So that's, that's how I got in. Beautiful. So there, there are two um, elements that I'd like to uh, pick up on. Uh, we, Ubuntu is one of them, and we can, we can get to that in a moment. Um, but first of all is, you know, there have been some quite well-publicized um, corporate failures in other African countries of very successful South African organizations. And like, what do you attribute those, um, what do you attribute, uh, failure might be a, a little bit overt, in certain instances are clearly the case, in other cases, maybe just a, an, an overestimation or assumptions, but what do you think are, have been the inherent oversights or realities that were not considered or unknown by those organizations that led to the uh, underwhelming performance of what they believed would be the case based on their South African uh, equivalent? I would say, you know, there's a three keywords we like to use a lot at Google, which is you adopt, you adapt, and then you innovate. But in, what I found is that most of the companies in the continent that I've observed all these 25 years, like, going, expanding to the continent, they use the adopt more than adapt or innovate. And the adopt is kind of copy paste of what works in South Africa. And they treat sometimes Africa as a country. So they, whatever works in South Africa should work in Nigeria or Ghana or Congo, which is kind of not true, even though we are all black, but there are variations of black and there are many dimensions of being black. And also even within Nigeria, Nigeria is not a homogeneous country. There's a variation and the diversity of Nigerians within Nigeria, whether you go north or south or anywhere within Nigeria, even Nigerians themselves are not as diverse, even though they share the same nationality. So the idea that you can just adopt and copy paste a model that worked in South Africa and apply it in the rest of the continent or any of the other countries in the continent tends to be flawed. The second one is who you send there. I have found in most instances, similar to multinationals coming to the continent of Africa, they tend to send people with the superiority complex, which, that, which basically is lack of humility. There's very little humility and there's, very, there's a lot that I'm here to save. It's kind of like a missionary a crusader conquest that I'm coming here to save the natives and I'm coming here to bring about enlightenment and I'm coming here to save the heathens. And so it's kind of like all of that. And I found a lot of superiority complex within those leaders. They have high IQ, but they are very low on emotional quotient is very low. And they're very low cultural quotient in terms of understanding the people's culture, their needs, the ways of doing business and how in that place they do business and respect as well. I sometimes find lack of respect because when I speak to people, they'll be like, these people don't know what they're doing. I'm like, no, it's not that they don't know what they do. You don't know them. How about we start there first? Because your conclusion is that they should know you. No, you are new here. They've been here longer than you. Why should they know you? First, they should trust you. 
What have you done to gain trust? Because trust is a great currency in the continent. And if you find, like I always say to multinationals who come here, if you notice like amongst most black Africans in particular, even Africana people actually, when we greet, most of our conversation, if not 50, 60% is in the greeting and conversation because I'm just trying to get to know you. And I'm actually trying to trust you first before I cut to the chase. The cutting to the chase is actually less work once I've established trust. If I don't trust you, no matter how clever you are, no matter how clever this thing that you're selling, highly likely I might not buy it. So I found like a lot of it is just this adoption mentality rather than adapt and innovate for that specific country. The second part being just humility and less superiority complex and arrogance. And then the third area just around trust. As in, we forget that it's a relationship. All relationships are founded on trust. And I mean, it, there's an equation I once read on trust that says trust equals character times competency times consistency over time. So it's C cube over time. And if you don't have, if you don't demonstrate great character to a person, and of course, even if you are competent, but you must be competent in their context because context matters. And then you must actually just do it consistently over time. You're more likely gonna win people because when I go to Nigeria or I go to Niger or I go to Ethiopia, even in Ethiopia, I don't speak the language, I'm married, but I am there. So my job is to establish trust first so that the Ethiopians can help me understand how to grow a business in Ethiopia and how to grow it in a way that shows respect to Ethiopians. Sorry, the last thing I've actually didn't cover is that what I've picked up with South Africa companies and global multinationals, very few of their executives have studied African history. And I actually find it a, even a limitation, even at business schools. Very few business schools have a module on history. A lot of the stuff we do is finance, economics, accounting, whatever, but there's very little understanding of history. So people go to a place not understanding the history of that place, its pain, its highs, its lows, because that gives you more compassion, empathy, Whereas when I go to Nigeria, I had to study almost everything about whether it's a Biafra war, understand how did Nigeria get independence? Who got it? Who were the player, key players? Who are the key players now? What is going on with the history of Zimbabwe or the history of Kenya or the history? You know, like if you better understand the history of a place, that also gives you even better context. And then the other part is that no effort is made in understanding language because language speaks to the heart. Second language speaks to the head. I found very few of the executives who are, I will call superstars or rising stars, go to a place and make zero effort in learning the language of the place. Zero, not even a few words, greeting, at least know how to say hi, how are you? None whatsoever. Whereas when you see when you go to a place and you learn even 10 keywords before you learn there, immediately people warm up because they can see you making an effort. So those are some of the things I would say, like either than just the normal business model didn't work, the value chain didn't work, the, the way they priced didn't work, but those are the ones for me I consider core beyond p &L or balance sheet. Yeah, I guess what, you know, what you're speaking to is, is, is culture ed, right? Yes. And, um, and 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 the, the you know the, we talk a lot about IQ and EQ and you you now sort of educating us around CQ if 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 you will or around culture uh, intelligence um, and uh, yeah it's amazing because you know what your last point is um, uh, particularly interesting is is how often a commercial failure is 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 attributed to uh, commercial systemic commercial challenges uh, and, and culture and trust and, and, and deep immersion uh, uh, learning, the visitor learning as opposed to the visitor barrel chestedly coming in and going, well, we've been successful elsewhere. So it's a slam dunk that we're going to do it here. And to your point, especially in Africa, because, you know, if we come from a developed part of the world, 
you know, developed part of the world and whatever, it, it means that we, we can go and tell them what to do. You, you know, so, may, I, may I please give you an example? Like, I have a mentor of mine, his name is Case, and he's Dutch. So when he came to South Africa to be the, I think, CEO of Unilever South Africa, he told no one. He went to Soweto and spent, I think, a month or two months, found a home, asked that family to adopt him, and he spent two months, if not a month or two, just immersing himself in the culture of a people. He couldn't speak that much English, but the people could see his heart and they could see his soul and he immersed himself in the culture. By the time he went to the boardroom to start day one at Unilever, no one could tell him what's going on in the townships, in the villages, because he was there on weekends. He was there and then he found a historian to teach him South African history. What happened? Who did what? 400 years. You see the stuff that by the time he gets to work to do the so-called clever work, balance sheet, p &L, cash flow, all of that market share, he comes in already with a lot more armor and a lot more insights that you can't gain from your computer because the desk is a dangerous place to view the world. So he understood that, that the desk is a dangerous place to view the world. And I, that's probably why we're still friends to this day. And so it's something like that for me practically that some people are willing to go the extra mile to reveal more of a people rather than just see a consumer. But you see people first who happen to consume. I just wrote down what you said is that desk is a dangerous place to view the world. I think that's probably why in many respects, the business plan um, is, is an exhibit alongside the uh, T-Rex uh, because often it's, it's at a desk that these things are so meticulously crafted uh, and uh, have little bearing uh, in, in reality on what uh, oftentimes what people are actually wanting, how they really need it, as opposed to what we think in the echo chamber of, of, of our minds in the boardroom. So um, I just wanted to, uh, before we continue, I just want to acknowledge uh, Mkabayelo, uh, Lise, uh, is it Lessi, Lukman, uh, Ashley, everybody, th thank you very much for your contributions in the chat. And what we'll do, in, uh, I'd like to put one more question to um, Mzamo before we open the floor. And uh, opening the floor really means that uh, this is your, your session and we'd really like you to engage in whatever way you'd like, either via the chat or if you'd like, you just pop up your digital hand uh, in the reaction slots at the bottom of your control bar, just put up your hand and, and I'll gladly call on you and you're welcome to engage with Mzamo directly. So, Continuing from what you were, the, the insights you were giving us around, you know, culture ed and, and history, you know, because what you're speaking to is, is, is way more anthropological than it is commercial. Um, and, and, and that, I mean, that, that's incredible. And, and one could argue that's how, um, that's the best way to get along is to 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 learn about each other as opposed to just want to be just kind of get the transaction done and profit made as soon as possible, which I think is one of the things that um, is, is, is a, a perennial challenge for companies while they're chasing targets and, 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 and KPIs. So while there are 3000 odd cultures within a continent of 54 countries, that's a whole lot of, of, of difference, nuance, history, uh, culture, ed, and so on. And something that gets used um, quite a bit in, in South Africa is, um, and in, in, in my experience, often quite uh, coyly, uh, sometimes just completely inappropriately, toe curlingly, is Ubuntu as a way of, of, of kind of bringing us together, this kind of uh, magical thing, uh, calling on the ancestors and all of this. Can you speak to that? Like, what is, what is your ex experience of it? Maybe if, if you can firstly just give us a quick definition of, of what Ubuntu is, and then if you can speak to that in your experience of it and how we can authentically 
incorporate Ubuntu more and better in, in our work, in our work together. Well, the way I've understood Ubuntu is, for me anyway, it's a practical example in the village I grew up in. The village I grew up in, even they still do it to this day, actually, I was there this weekend. If one, if the neighbor loses their cow or their crops, the village, those who have more, will decide, like for example, my father will go, or my grandfather in that instance, will go to the neighbor and say, listen, here are five cows from my crawl to your crawl. The other one gives five, whatever. First thing they do is restore the person's dignity because they understand something called balance. And they understand something that doesn't need a PhD that if this person is hungry, they are, unfortunate parts of their survival instincts will kick in and they might then start stealing and causing an imbalance to this community. Not because they want to, because sometimes poverty decriminalizes people, which is it does all the time. Poverty decriminalizes people. And so they understood that they didn't need a PhD to understand that they were just communal. They were not communist, they were communal. And they also understood that when that neighbor now takes care of those cows, for every calf that comes out of those cows, if there's three or two calves, one will be his, one will go back to my grandfather. And then at some point, after a two years or three, that neighbor is restored. And all Ubuntu at the core is balance. It's the idea that it's not a zero sum game. Whereas what I found in South Africa sometimes is because we talk about race, it's either or, it's not end end. So when you say to a white person equality or, or you are privileged, the only thing they're hearing is for you to also not be privileged, I must be less privileged. So it's a zero sum game or I must lose and you must gain. So there's a lot of zero sum game discussions in the continent, even in South Africa on race. It's very much even on gender, men, be, some men, actually majority if not, what they hear when they ask about women equality, they then hear men inequality. As if like you can't have women equality and men inequality that makes up gender equality. Some so-called straight people, when they hear LGBTQ rights, LGBTQ plus rights, all they hear is straight people losing their rights. So it's a zero sum game. Whereas all Ubuntu is saying is, I am because we are. And what it acknowledges is, it acknowledges the I in a we, but it also acknowledges the we makes up an I. And the two are interdependent, not independent. And what we try, what I found sometimes with Western societies and cultures is, the thing is that it's very reductionist culture of either or, not end end. And what I've learned in my villages was that I can prosper and have lots of cows. He can also, or she, prosper and have lots of cows and it's end end. But also what I've learned in my village as well is competency matters. When people talk about Ubuntu, they don't like always embedding the concept of competency. Ubuntu does reward individual competency because in my village, there were people who have more cows than others who had more land or who had more productive land than others because they just smarter or maybe they just have higher IQ or maybe just more productive. They wake up much earlier than everyone else. They're more conscientious, conscientious and productive than everyone else. So embedded Ubuntu is not socialism, is not communism. It's, it's embracing the individual, but not at the expense of the community. So it's kind of like what other, I think in philosophy, you call it ut utilitarianism, where the greater good is way more important than just a good for the individual. So we must not just only worship the individual, which I sometimes feel the West, particularly Europe and the US does a lot. We must also, but when I go to Asia, Japan or China or India, they still worship the community as much as they worship the individual. So it's just finding that balance between individual empowerment versus community empowerment. And it's end-end, it's not either. 
Yeah, fantastic. I've, um, I'm, I'm just mindful of time and uh, unfortunately we're not booked on this uh, particular call until midnight, Barry. Uh, an, an, an hour is five hours too short, but uh, be that as it may, we will we'll maximize the time. Um, I just wanted to start to uh, engage with the chat and um, while it, Tabani's question isn't wasn't first. I mean, some of the some of the chat is also comments and, and, and uh, intrigue, and, and we'll get to as many as we can. I'd like to pick up Tabani. Tabani's question is 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 a really significant one with the, in the in the context of this conversation. So uh, Mzamo, Tabani asked, why do African leaders why are African leaders so submissive to the West and to the West and disregard each other? You know each, each other as leaders in Africa. What stops Africans uh, from being creative and fighting for their own belongings? Yeah, that's a um, that's an elephant question. So let me not be politically correct. Let me not be politically correct. Let me just say I remember once I read a book. I think it was written by Shinwi Ashebe. I think it's called The Trouble with Nigeria. And I read this book. That book is very small tiny, but it's actually influenced me a lot. And at the end of it, there's a, a line I liked where he says that there's nothing wrong with Nigerian water or Nigerian air or Nigerian people. The trouble at the core of Nigeria is leadership. And I just wish that what he wrote was not the trouble with Nigeria. He should have just said the trouble with Africa. It should have just read that, that way because it's consistent across many, many African countries. If maybe I exclude Rwanda it will be consistent across many African countries that at the core is leadership. But then we should then ask ourselves, how did these leaders get into power? Do they get into power on competency or do they get into power on other reasons? And who puts them into power? And then we should go back to history and look at our history. When we got the independence in 1950s and 60s, which leaders got into power and who supported them to get into power? Is it France? Is it Britain? Is it the USA? What were their intentions for putting those people in power? And we should ask ourselves, has colonization really left us or we're we just living with neo-colonization? Are we still genuinely, are we genuinely, have we decolonized our minds completely, which we haven't? And we also need to ask those questions and just be honest with each other that perhaps what we have done, there's a book I used to like a lot, it's called the, the Oppressor and the Oppressed. And where it talks about the master has not left. The master is just now rules from afar and has mouthpieces within the continent. And so we are still ruled by the master, but from afar. So if we are all being honest with ourselves that majority of the leaders that lead us perhaps they themselves are just instruments of someone else. And they themselves are also products of hunger in the sense that, I mean, I hear South African politicians that would say, we didn't fight for freedom to go hungry. As if that was the reason they were fighting for freedom was to get BEE deals and tenders. And but that's what they seem to say. And they say it with pride that the only way to um, political, security for them is economic greed. And so, but that's something that we should all be honest on. And at the core for me is, unfortunately, if we were to do an assessment on competency, the majority of political appointments are not founded on competency. They are not founded on meritocracy. They just founded on comradeship. And if me and you went to Robben Island or me and you were in exile, then we more likely I will give you a job, but majority. Other competent civil servants, I've met them. They exist. Do they get to rise up the ladder? Does government have a strong succession plan based on competency and character? Unfortunately, I don't see that. So if we say trust equals competency times character times consistency, what I see lacking in our political leaders is competency and character. And character is just values, integrity, respecting the people who voted for you. Don't steal, don't be corrupt, don't do those things. But unfortunately, that's for me what's lacking is competency and character done consistently over time. 
And what, what you've just spoken to now reminds me of the insights that you shared about corporate failures in Africa and the attributes required and the characteristics lacking uh, are, are very similar. And the reason I highlight that is it's often easy to paint governments with a different brush to the competency and character of leadership in, 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 in corporations in the private sector. Um, and so the attributes that you speak to, again, the competency and character are kind of are, are, are key, regardless of the leadership context. I mean, I once read a study, particularly since most CEOs have been predominantly men for a very long time. Most of those CEOs, if you look at the history of the ones who have fallen, it was mostly not always competence. It's actually courage. It's a flawed courage that trips it, particularly men. I, 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 there's not enough data yet. There hasn't been enough, a long history of women in power in a majority. So we'll talk about men at this point that it seems to me that the biggest hurdle or the biggest blind spot has been character. And when character weakens, normally people go down here. Yeah. And, and often because of fear, which is inherent in all of us, undealt with fear, me and hiding out, uh, being secretive, not being truthful is often how it manifests and then it's judged as a lack of competency. Yes. Um, but as, from a source of, of oftentimes, possibly not even a lack of character, a struggling character that believes, and to your point, particularly in men, is if, if particularly if I'm a senior individual, I'm a CEO, and, and whatever the buck stops with me, I'm the throat to choke. I need to know this stuff. I need to understand it. And if I don't, I need to pretend and, 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 and keep the wolves away from me for as long as possible. Um, I just wanted to move on to Spiwe's uh, question. Um, Mzama, please expand on the concept of psychological safety and how that is practicalized in Google. Okay, thank you very much. Psychological safety really is, at the core of it is that I need to know that, for example, if John is my leader, I need to know that I can have a relationship where I can speak truth to power and I'm safe and that there will be no retaliation. I can also have disagreements with John where we agree to disagree, but it's all founded on respect and care, but we will still be forthright with each other, but with care and respect. The key word on psychological safety that is required is that when I go into those meetings, where let's say I'm an underrepresented group, because if you come from an underrepresented group and you go in a meeting where you are still a minority, you are going to be excluded. You are, and whether intentionally or unintentionally, you are going to be stereotyped. You are going to be biased. There's a data I once read, it says, if you're less than 33% of the population in that meeting or in that company, you are going to be biased, excluded, discriminated. You are going to have microaggressions, uh, micro insults. All of those things are going to happen to you. That's not a culture of psychological safety. That's a culture where you feel unsafe. And when you feel unsafe, it's when you are in meetings where you have something to say, but you filter, you doubt it, you don't say it. And then someone else says it and you're like, shit, I actually had that idea two hours ago. I'm so late. And, but you were scared to say it because you were worried that someone's gonna call you an asshole or someone called you dumb or they're gonna laugh at you or something's gonna happen. So that's the kind of culture that Google says is toxic. And psychological safety really is an environment where there is radical candor. So we're not saying there's no radical candor. We're not walking on eggs around you, but there's lots of care and respect because on also another area around psychological safety, there's something we called um, a protective hesitation, which normally happens that the, those who are in the privileged group 
will hesitate to give constructive radical candor feedback to those who are in the underrepresented group. In the spirit of not wanting to be seen as chauvinistic if it's versus is towards women, or if it's towards a white person to a black person, they don't wanna be perceived as racist or they're more worried about being perceived as racist than telling the person that you suck. And instead of saying to the person, it has nothing to do with your skin color, you just suck. And in this area you suck and you need to improve. Your skin color has nothing to do with it or nothing to do with your gender or your sexual orientation. But people don't do that. If you, if you so-called straight or born again Christian, you're dealing with someone LGBTQ and now you walk around on eggs and you don't give them radical candor feedback, that person never grows. They are not in a psychology. Both of you are not safe. You don't feel safe. The manager doesn't feel safe to give constructive radical candor feedback. The direct report doesn't get constructive feedback that will grow them. That environment is toxic and not safe. And I've been in those environments. I've been once in a board meeting where I just started, which I won't mention the company, and they, the leader stood up and said, you fucking monkeys. And I was sitting there, I was like, holy fuck, what just happened? I just been called a monkey. And now I'm thinking to myself, what do I say? What do I say? And I said nothing, but I couldn't sleep. The entire night, all I'm now, I'm pissed off that someone called me a monkey. And I called that leader at 1 a.m to say to them, what you said at 11 a.m., I am still playing it at 2 a.m. at night. If you ever call me that again in your entire existence, I will resign, but I will wait for you outside the gate and I will beat you up because I have zero tolerance. It's no longer corporate, I'll go street on you. And it will be me and street. You can go and lay a charge at the police, but I'll also lay a charge of racism against you. And then he was like, oh shit, very sorry. No one has ever given me this tough feedback before. But I said to him, but you were wrong. This is really wrong. It's disrespectful and hateful, but it took a lot. And then between me and that leader, we became close. Because for once we built an, and then he said to me, please going forward, say it as you feel it, as you see it. I won't retaliate. I'll take the feedback. I am not getting feedback. So I'll take it because as a leader, the challenge with being a leader, Everyone is just kissing ass. Everyone is just saying, yes, yes, John. It's probably lonely to be John because kind of sometimes no one just tells him straight up. You know, like if I'm, I'm been a CMO for a long time and sometimes I find like 80% of people are not telling me the truth. And I hear it behind the scenes or I hear it on the ground, but some, there's only one or two who are, have the courage to speak truth to power. And really psychological safety is, being in an environment where you can have the courage to speak truth to power and there will be no retaliation and there will be no negative condescending remarks about you and there will be no giggles around you because you speak your truth to power. The only thing that the person needs to learn though who prides themselves of being honest also have respect and care and also have timing because that's another thing I'm learning sometimes with my team is that timing is everything. Sometimes you can speak your truth, but you just need to read the situation and have timing because sometimes your truth won't land well in that time. It's not the right time. Maybe it's just shut the fuck up, go, wait for the right time, then go speak truth to power. But to pride yourself on being honest, but rude, that's also not, not cool. So you must be honest, but with care and respect, plus timing. But your, your last point is so, so important here because it, it, it's not even the, the, the obvious scenarios like knee jerk and, you know, bah, you know that, that kind of uh, sloppy response uh, out, of, out of, you know, anger and, 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 and retaliation. But it, it comes back to what you, you've been sharing, sharing all evening, culture ed. Um, you know, Barry is... is, 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 is a master of time you know he's built a career on on time and and you know he, he he's developed that into the metaphor for 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 life as timing is everything and often timing is more art than science because i might believe i'm i'm discerning that now is a good time 
the reality is I really don't know until I've landed what I need to or what I choose to land and, and how it's received. So, you know, I, I guess that's what makes life uh, challenging and, and exciting in equal me measure. Good. All right. We've got, uh, what I'd like to quickly do, um, I'd like to uh, put to you, Mzamo, Ashley and Leslie's questions. Uh, Ashley's first. I know that there are no shortcuts. However, what are the common cultural or behavioral denominators to, to grasp in Africa before going into the boardroom? That can be part one of the, quest, uh, the, the, the question. And part two from Lessie is, as we look towards attributes for future-focused African businesses, how can we encourage creation for more local innovative solutions rather than settling for international consumption? Okay. So before I answer those two questions, the other way we operationalize psychological safety is a feedback mechanism, like 360 feedback. At Google, for example, we have something we've been called a PMR score, a people manager review score, where if your score is below 75, it's worrying because in it, embedded in it, we're measuring psychological safety. Even in the team, there's a 360 feedback. So how you get rated, you get rated on how plus what. In most companies, I found there's more emphasis on what you do, not on how you do it. And at Google now, there's more emphasis on not just what you do, plus how you do it. And how you do it also matters as much as what you do. Because the what you do is more your ability, competency, IQ. Your how you do it is more the EQ part. So that's the kind of thing now that is very much on track that is being measured consistently. Even it affects your bonus, your share allocation, your salary increase, your promotion. And if you get poor scores, more likely you won't get promoted. And then there will have to be an intervention to help you improve on those scores. If you're not improving over multiple attempts, then you, you're not fit for purpose then you're never going to be a leader. You might maybe be a soldier on the ground, but you'll never be a general or a lieutenant or anything to lead a people. So that's really not another way where they are operationalizing psychological safety. The question on what's common, as much as there are differences within the continent, we did, I remember even when I worked at Unilever, we did a global study on poor people, low income consumers, what's common, what's different. There's always commonalities, just as much as there are differences. For example, in the continent, we know, I'll give you a few examples. Like when I go into the boardroom on um, content, what makes content sell? I know that video, vernacular, voice, and visual works. It doesn't matter which country in Africa you are. People consume video and they like what's visual, they like audio, and they like their mother tongue, which is vernacular. So I know that I don't need, um, I know it works in Nigeria as much as it works in South Africa. The only thing that changes is how I do it. The how changes, but the common beast on content creation don't change. Just because I'm in Algeria versus Congo or DRC versus Nigeria or Zimbabwe or Malawi, those things I go in already knowing. For example, when I interview um, a lot of 16 to 34 year olds, I know that there are four unmet needs that we need to solve for. One of them is make money now. Help me make money now. That I know because 74% of youth in South Africa are unemployed. 60% plus of youth in most of African countries are unemployed. They wanna make money now. So that's a common theme and a common variable that I know now. So I go into that boardroom knowing that. The second thing I know is um, there are people like it when you show cultural empathy and sensitivity. Africans, are, actually I always say to people, Africans are not yet Africans. Even within Nigeria, I found even within Nigeria, there are certain countries in the continent where I speak to people, they tell me about their tribe first before they tell me about their nation. Or they will tell me about their region first before they tell me about their nation. So I know that even within Africans, as much as we like to say African Union, African, we are not as always African. We first our tribe. 
or you first your region and then you are your nation and then maybe you are your region Sadek, if lucky. Some people even don't move beyond Sadek. And then if you like it, maybe you West African. Those things you hear later in the conversation. But someone would always tell me what tribe they are in Kenya without even me asking. So that immediately tells me. So those are some of the things that I go in the boardroom already knowing. The other thing I know in the boardroom is that 16 to 34 year olds want to help me, help me succeed, which is education, number one thing, mostly education or any hustle. So I know that. So I know the keyword is helpfulness. Now, I then go into that boardroom. When I go to Kenya, I try to think helpfulness matters in Kenya. But now, how do I do helpfulness in a way that Kenyans understand? How do I do helpfulness in a way that Nigerians understand? And then, if I can transfer what works in Nigeria, for example, there are things that, are, that travel. For example, if I look at Nigerian music, it has traveled globally. So it, it's not true that there aren't things that are common within the continent that travel right through. If you listen to Jerusalem, the song, everyone in the continent knows it, but also everyone in the continent knows Davido. So on, everyone knows Saudi in anywhere else. So it's not that there aren't things in the continent that travel that are common. It's just that the only way to know that though, to know what's common is that you have to immerse yourself in the people's world because the desk is the dangerous place to view the world. So you have to immerse yourself. So those are some of the things that I know going in are common. Now, the other area I know is common in the boardroom is grow revenue, grow users, grow usage, grow market share. I mean, it's not like rocket science. Everyone kind of knows that when you go to that boardroom, we're gonna look at grow revenue, grow profit, grow users, grow usage. I mean, that's not rocket science, grow brand. It's all about growth. And so I go to boardrooms knowing that we are here about growth. And the only thing I'm adding is how do we do it in a sustainable way? How do we do it with humility, with respect? How do we do it in such a way that we double the size of the business while reducing environmental impact and while increasing social impact? So when I go into boardrooms, for me, I'm thinking, of course, everyone always say 3X, 10X the size of the business. That's not new news. No one has said anything clever if they write that in their whatever as an, as a, as an OKR or, or KPI. Then of course, mine is more fine. You will double the size of the business, but are you gonna reduce environmental impact and are you gonna increase social impact? And if we can do those three, then we're good. If, if you're only doing the first one, then I don't wanna be in that boat. And then the other area about, um, I don't have a problem per se with internationalization concepts into Africa, because for me, no one has a trademark or patent on ideas. So I don't have a problem with us dealing with pride. I mean, if you think about it, the Chinese and the Japanese, the way they grew, they also sent people to America. They sent them to Europe to learn. And then they came back and built Toyota, but they did it their way, the Japanese way, smaller cars instead of bigger cars. That's learning and coping others, but then adapting it to your cultural context. So as Africans, I don't think there's very few unique original things on earth. There's very few. I mean, Amazon, even Facebook or Google, Google is not search, is not new. There were seven or eight or 10 search engines before Google search. Everyone builds on someone. It's rare. I mean, Amazon is built on website logistics retail, that's not something that Amazon invented. It was always there. They just pull it all together and that's what makes Amazon great. But they didn't necessarily invent anything new per se, other than how to put it all together. There were e-commerce retail before Amazon. So for me, it's, it's, I'm not actually obsessed with original. I'm obsessed with best and better. If we as Africans, we are able to look at other nations and what they've done in Singapore or Japan or China and stop learning only from the, from the UK and US only. There's a lot to learn in Vietnam, Indonesia, a lot more than actually we think you'll only learn in France or because those are our colonial masters. So there's not like much they would teach us always because they still wanna plunder us most of the time. So let's go else as well and learn 
what other people are doing and then combine it and combine it and then come up with things that come, most people don't realize, for example, prepaid airtime is an African invention, not just in Pesa, mobile money. There are other things that we, ATM, it's an African invention that becomes global. Prepaid as a concept, airtime is an African invention, Vodacom, that didn't exist globally. But the, is the concept new or prepaid? No, that concept is not new. But is prepaid airtime in cell phones or telecoms new? Yes. Was it invented here? Yes. But are there other things we should steal with pride? I'm, for me, I think it should be 90% adopt and adapt, only 10% invent. I, will, I think we should give awards for adapting and adopting and stop obsessing with original. There's very few original things on earth. Oh, that's so refreshing. It really is. It, it's so refreshing because we are so obsessed with we have to be the first and it's got to be original and, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and interestingly, a, a couple of years ago, I, someone mentioned that, um, you know, the, the kind of benchmarking uh, principle as well. This is slightly counter to, 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 to what we've just been talking about, is, 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 is a dangerous principle to uh, work to. Because with the, 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 the rationale being that, what if the benchmark, meaning the, the height of the bar that you are now pegging to, is actually that high, yeah. you know, relative to whatever that high is? Um, and uh, so that, you know, that's quite an interesting thing. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we're out of time and, uh, I guess the, it, it, it it's unfortunate in one way and, and fortunate in another way, because now we can go and have dinner and percolate, um, what, uh, this conversation has uh, revealed and, uh, and, and we can see what emerges. So, Mzama, like, you know, thank you seems uh, too meager, but I'll, I'll say thank you to you anyway. And, um, you know, I don't know if you're going to run 300 kilometers before dinner, but uh, may you have a have, have a good meal and uh, time with the family. Um, John, would you like to uh, conclude for us? Before John yeah. says something, may I please remind everyone that please, all I might ask you is that what we didn't talk about was well-being. Is that can you please just make sure you take care of yourselves, you exercise, you have enough sunshine, D, nutrition matters. For men in particular, please see a therapist, use your employee assistant program and see a therapist. Therapy has saved my life. And all I could say to all of you is that in times like these, please do take care of your well-being and please be vulnerable with your loved ones, have strong relationships, but do make sure you have the right foundation, exercise, nutrition, sunshine, D, sleep. Take out the device at night, have a healthy hygiene, device hygiene culture with your kids and yourself. So just those are my last words. If anything you forget, just please take care of your loved one and yourself and put the oxygen mask on you first so that at least you're the best person ever.